so welcome everyone to um, back to the electoral integrity workshop um, for 2022 um, and welcome in particular to this roundtable session um, looking at electoral observation during and after the pandemic so obviously the main theme of the workshop has been to think about electoral backsliding and we began by looking at some of the data about whether this was occurring and where this was occurring which aspects of the, of the electoral process uh, may be the most affected uh, and then yesterday we then looked at how the pandemic had posed particular challenges for electoral integrity and again how some countries seem to have weathered that um, better than others and some aspects of the election seems to be better than others um, and just half an hour ago we were looking then at election observation and we had some uh, kind of research papers looking at some of the latest research on uh, electoral observation so this panel kind of brings uh, all those things uh, together uh, in many ways um, and thinking about these big themes and we're kind of thinking about well, what happened to electoral observation during the course of the pandemic? Did it have to change? Did it work differently? You know, what worked? Um, what didn't? Are there lessons from the pandemic period for the future about how uh, the, the electoral observation process could work better? Um, or are there things perhaps to, to look out for and some, and, some, and some danger signs there? So we were delighted to have um, a, a kind of all-star panel. We'll begin in a moment with um, Eric Aspeland from uh, International Idea. Uh, it's worth saying that Eric's been the collaborator between uh, the Lectural Integrity Project and International Idea over the course of um, well, over two years now, um, where we've kind of been working very closely looking at uh, how the pandemic has affected electoral integrity. And Eric is going to introduce part of um, this research um, a research paper that will eventually form part of a book that will be available later on in 2022. Um, so he'll give those research findings to begin with. And then we've got um, th um, three practitioners um, explaining how the pandemic has affected their organisations and how their organisations have um, re responded to that. Um, so we're delighted to have Holly from um, the o sorry, EODS. Um, we're like, delighted to have Jonathan Stone Street uh, from the Carter Centre and Adrissa Kamira from uh, African Union. But I'll give them a, a formal introduction shortly. So, but we'll begin with um, Eric, who's going to speak to, as I say, Eric's been working closely with us at the, at the Electoral Integrity Project over the course of the last couple of years on this. Uh, but he's also very active in many other areas uh, for International Idea. Um, he's working as the Deputy Chair uh, of the Building Resources in Democracy, Governance and Elections programme, otherwise uh, known to most people, especially me uh, as Bridge, and has expertise in other areas such as training, education, research and election administration, electoral risk management and the financing of elections. And he's um, very well known, having worked with many electoral bodies um, around the world and civil society organisations as well. So thank you and uh, welcome to Eric. Uh, floor Hello. Is yours. Hello. Uh, classic question. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Perfect. So hello and greetings from uh, Stockholm, Sweden, where I'm currently based. Um, uh, first, I, I just want to thank uh, Holly Ann Garnett and Tim James for organising this international conference and for including my organization, International Idea, as a co-sponsor. Uh, I attended yesterday's session on elections and COVID-19 and today's session on monitoring elections. And I was very impressed with the high quality research uh, and the presenters and the very active participation. Um, I would also now like to thank Holly, Jonathan and Idrissa for sharing this kind of virtual space with me and for reading the first draft of a paper that uh, Toby, Alistair and myself wrote on the topic. Um, my presentation will be around 10 minutes uh, and I hope that there will be time for some questions afterwards. Um, so uh, just by way of background, International Idea has been reporting on the pandemic and its impact on uh, electoral processes since early 2020. Uh, two recent papers uh, include electoral processes navigating and emerging from crisis uh, and uh, another paper supporting election uh, effectively principles and practices of electoral systems are two papers I think I can kind of highlight, but all of our papers are, 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 are on the global overview of COVID-19 impact on elections report. So you can find those papers there and 
various sorts of papers that we've published. Uh, as Toby mentioned, International Idea together with uh, EIP, uh, University of East Anglia, Newcastle University, UK Research Council, uh, and approximately two dozen researchers have published, I think, 26 case studies on elections during COVID. Uh, some of uh, countries that we kind of covered include Poland, USA, Jordan, Argentina, Netherlands, Ghana, South Korea. There are many countries. Um, and Toby, Alistair, and I have also published several articles during the last two years, which includes kind of cost of elections, participation in elections, campaigning, special voting arrangements, and so forth. Um, now, um, we also published one case or one feature article, I think in 2021, Toby, uh, on international observation, which kind of formed the basis uh, of this, uh, rip, this um, uh, paper. Um, and uh, I could just say uh, that all of these, um, and this paper is uh, how international election observation was affected by COVID-19, uh, and it's going to be made available in this uh, larger volume on electoral integrity in COVID-19. Um, so I, I think what the, the main uh, focus here is just to say that we want to highlight some of the challenges of international election observation that they experienced in terms of uh, deployment, uh, how elections uh, adapted to COVID-19, uh, the restrictions, and what were some of the innovations introduced uh, the paper also highlights to what extent international election um, observation missions evaluated COVID-19 practices, such as like COVID-19 health and safety compliance. This paper also concludes with some broad lessons learned and recommendations. So I'll, I'll try to cover bits of all of this in turn. Um, <clears throat> data was collected from uh, 92 international election uh, observation statements and reports both preliminary and final uh, on 59 countries that had national elections uh, observed between March 2020 and December 2021. This represents, we think, the majority of the missions that took place during the first two years of the pandemic. Uh, data was also collected from observation organizations' websites, in particular the EU and the OSCE, a, a documentary analysis of reports and interviews um, with members of observer organizations. So what were some of the challenges? Um, and I'm going to try to go through this uh, in briefly. I think here I, uh, are some of the challenges listed in our in our paper, but I'm certain that other that the other panel members could add some more on top of this, uh, in step, in, especially in terms of the operational challenges. But uh, in our paper, uh, it identifies uh, major restrictions on international travel, availability of flights, closed borders. Uh, and uh, the restrictions concerning movement in country. Uh, also the kind of what we saw in the beginning of the pandemic, a 14 day quarantine period for observers. Uh, and this also uh, contributed to some financial constraints. Uh, safety of personnel was also a challenge, of course, access to good facilities for the core team, the LTOs and STOs. Um, risk of spreading the virus was also a, a concern. Uh, uh, and this was also linked to this kind of reputational damage. Uh, and then uh, lastly, but also um, invitation or the accreditation not always provided by the host country or they were, it was provided very late. Um, countries such as Burundi and, and Russia come to mind. Um, so next, um, European Union election observation mission. So by way of ben benchmark, we. Uh, of pre-pandemic, the EU, um, as you can see in the table, deployed 16 election observation missions in 2018 and, uh, and 14 in 2019. However, this dropped to just five in 2020 uh, before rising back up to 12 in 2021. Moreover, the nature and scope of the mission were substantially reduced. Full-fledged uh, EOMs, uh, typically consisting of more than 100 observers, decreased from 16 to eight during the same period. This substantial decrease in the European Union election observation missions, according to the interviews that we did, uh, were primarily due to COVID-19. <clears throat> For the OCE, the overall number uh, of missions was, uh, was a little less of an impact uh, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, pandemic, but uh, by way of benchmark, in 2018, there were 16 missions, uh, and in 2019, there were 13. 
This fell to 15 in 2020 before dropping to 11 in 2021. Uh, although the number of emissions before COVID and during the pandemic period of 2020-2021 are kind of similar in number, there was a radical change in the type of election observation mission. For example, in 2018-2019, 15 full-scale EO emissions, now these are typically composed of between 120 to all 870, I think, in the case of Ukraine, uh, uh, were deployed through uh, throughout OEC member states compared to only three in 2020-2021. So did uh, election observation missions adapt? Uh, uh, as I just highlighted, the OSCE was able to deploy observers by changing type and size of election observation mission uh, from kind of this full-fledged EOMs to limited EOMs. Uh, another um, uh, example of how uh, missions were able to, or how organizations were able to adapt, was to use local observers. Um, Jonathan will talk more about this, I'm sure, but in Myanmar, the Carter Center observation mission which was predominantly run by a core team working remotely, abandoned their plans to deploy long-term observers from outside the country due to uh, Myanmar's closing its borders and suspending international commercial flights. Uh, instead, as a Carter Center recruited 24 Myanmar nationals who were accredited as international observers, which was possible under Myanmar's legal framework. Um, another example is the use of foreign nationals based in, in country missions. Um, ahead of the election observation mission to, this, uh, to the December 2020 Ghana uh, elections, the EU increased the number of locally recruited short-term observers from primarily uh, diplomatic services and EU nationals working in international organizations, uh, organizations rather than deploying uh, short-term observers from Europe. This kind of new arrangement was, was, was what made it kind of possible for the EU to kind of return to normal uh, uh, and, uh, and kind of start deploying more people uh, or more missions and 20, and around mid-2021 onwards. Last, uh, the use of uh, virtual remote observers. Um, this is uh, an example where uh, IRI and NDI in Ethiopia and also the Commonwealth in, in, in Malawi. So in Ethiopia, for example, the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute deployed a limited election observation mission to the uh, to the election. Uh, virtual interviews were conducted instead of personal interview, interviews um, with a wide range of uh, electoral stakeholders. Um, many countries that held elections in 2020, 2021 introduced restrictions on campaigning as well as health and safety measures. Compliance with these measures by stakeholders and to some extent enforcement was monitored by uh, most election observer missions as part of their observation methodology. However, this wasn't kind of universally the case. Uh, based on our review of the 92 preliminary statements uh, and final reports, um, that uh, we, we, we did notice that there were um, several uh, missions that did not kind of look or focus on health and safety compliance. Um, some countries that kind of came up were Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Germany, and so on. So both in 20 and 2021. So uh, kind of what were the lessons learned? Well, um, and I think both Alistair and, and, and Toby, I think they're both on the, well, Toby's on the call, of course, but uh, Alistair's probably here uh, on the call as well. Uh, but uh, I think the general lesson was that the pandemic did have a major consequence uh, for the extent and nature of electoral observation around the world. Uh, observation was therefore limited in 2020 and those missions which were undertaken were often um, much smaller in size. Uh, the pandemic therefore did cause a compromise uh, in the quality and coverage of election observation. Uh, there was some good evidence of a kind of a rebound in 2021. Um, however, as um, election observation missions adapted to the pandemic. Uh, the paper also recommends that future election observer uh, observation reports includes uh, assessments about how uh, the election was uh, adapted for emergency conditions and whether any such procedures were implemented uh, and enforced on the ground. So with that, uh, I'd like to 
thank you for your attention and over to you, Toby. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Eric, um, for giving um, an overview of um, the, the paper. And as I say, this will be part of a volume uh, which will be freely available to download um, later in the year as part of a, uh, it will be a very big book, I think, it's better to say, Eric, um, on the COVID and elections, looking at the lessons going forward. Uh, but without further ado, we'll go to um, our next uh, panellist, um, Holly. Um, who is the team leader of the EU project Election Ob Observation Democracy Support, uh, which provides training and methodology support for EU election observation missions. Uh, and she's previously served as an election advisor for the OSCE uh, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and as a senior program officer for elections at NDI as well. Um, she's published a broad range of um, books and uh, handbooks uh, and so we're very grateful for Holly uh, for joining us. So Holly, um, over to you. Thanks Toby, can you hear me okay? Perfectly, thank you. So I'd like to start by just stressing that my project supports EU election observation, that's our main purpose. So um, as, as you said Toby, but just that I'm not speaking on behalf of the institutions themselves, but on, our, on behalf of our project that provides support to the missions in the field. So um, while I'm very familiar with the EU missions, I can't speak on their behalf. Um, and I think Eric did a good job of laying out what the challenges were, so I won't repeat what he said. I just want to stress a few things and maybe um, add a little bit of my own experience and reflection, as I'm sure uh, the other panelists will do. Um, first of all, that in 2020, I mean, not only was election observation challenged, but elections themselves were, were deeply challenged. And in fact, um, quite a few elections were either canceled or postponed initially um, after the pandemic broke. So when I think you see that our observation missions went down to almost zero in 2020, it's true that also some elections weren't happening. Um, there were so many challenges at the beginning that I think in terms of travel and just to emphasize for people who don't know, um, EU election observation missions are a massive logistical exercise. So on average, they include uh, 100 foreign nationals coming from um, countries all over Europe and um, traveling to countries all over the world. The EU um, observes outside its member states. So we don't observe in the OSCE region, we observe in Africa, um, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. And so actually it wasn't possible initially in most cases to deploy people from Europe um, to the countries where elections were happening, um, either because of travel restrictions on the side of the EU countries or travel restrictions on the side of the host countries. Uh, quarantines, as Eric mentioned, although we did send people to countries where they had to quarantine for two weeks and then they remained in the country to um, observe, uh, for example, in Myanmar. But it, as he rightly said, we uh, weren't able to send a full observation mission. Instead, the EU sent three people, which was an election expert mission. That wasn't a new part. I mean, that's an existing part of our methodology is where we can't observe with a full scale EOM. We observe with a smaller mission, an EEM. Um, and so in some cases, EEMs were deployed instead of an EOM. So a much smaller mission, but instead of 100 people, three people or in the case of Bolivia, I think that was stretched to seven people. So that was um, the solution that we found. Um, I think that there was a big question in 2020, how do we restart? I think there was some concern if we don't start observing, you know, also what is the downside of not observing elections? Um, the risk of not going to an important election. Um, and in some cases we had countries where the election authorities really wanted the EU to come. I think uh, one example was Ghana, which was the first place that the EU went in 2020, in December 2020, with a, what we would call a full-scale EU EOM mission, although we didn't send short-term observers, as Eric said, from Europe. Instead, um, Europeans from diplomatic 
um, missions and international observers, um, um, international organizations observed as short term observers. Um, let's see. So, yeah, so we did, in fact, have smaller missions. Um, so as far as the EU is concerned, we felt that we maintained our methodology, so we didn't change the way that we observed elections, except for this um, change in terms of not sending short-term observers from Europe, uh, which was just seen as not possible, um, given the constraints on, on flights and also the concerns about health, both of, both of our own personnel and also um, the people in the countries where we're observing. Um, I wanted to stress that the other thing that the other kind of mission that we weren't able to deploy were election follow-up missions. So in the EU context, follow-up to election um, observer recommendations has become a, a major part of what we do. So it's not just about sending observer missions um, around elections, but also tracking how to what extent those recommendations that are made by missions are followed up. Um, as part of a wider um, election reform in, in the countries where we observe. And that came to a complete halt for two years. Um, I, I think not only for the EU, but for other observer organizations as well. And election reform processes in the countries where we observe were also halted. So to a great extent, I would say, legislatures were either not meeting or meeting online, had different priorities. So I think that when we're talking about election observation and election reform, we should also just, or when we think about how COVID affected elections, we should also think about how it affected the election reform agenda. Um, now the EU has quite a big backlog of election follow-up missions. So those are small missions that travel during the election cycle to countries to see to what extent recommendations have been followed up on. So for the EU's work, that was quite a big impact. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that methodologically, the EU, um, my project developed for the EU, um, a document called Points of Inquiry for Observing Elections During Public Health Emergencies. That was a very short document. It's only about five pages, but it, um, it laid out at every stage of the election process what questions um, core team members might wish to ask their interlocutors about the effect of COVID on the election process itself, including you know, the, in the integrity of the process. So we encouraged our missions not only to look at the extent to, to which health restrictions were complied with, but also to look to see if election integrity was affected by aspects um, of, of the pandemic and of the, the mitigation measures that were put in place. So, and that was done because we noticed that the reporting wasn't necessarily consistent on those aspects between countries. And we wanted to make sure that there was a consistency and that those important issues were picked up. So um, we also had, for example, a lot of missions um, noted that social media the campaign in some countries shifted almost completely to social media, which is a you know a trend that we see anyway. Um, political parties turning to social media, but in some countries this was very pronounced, and it probably sped up that trend to some extent in countries where we were observing. But also in other countries, there were issues about the right to assembly uh, that were affected by health measures that maybe weren't always. Um, implemented in an equal way between different um, competing parties. Um, lessons learned, I think we're still sort of processing because we still feel very much in the pandemic. And I think that when the EU sends missions to countries or when it sends an exploratory mission to consider uh, what kind of mission to send and um, what preparations will be necessary for the mission that we're still considering and taking into consideration the pandemic trends and uh, the extent to which COVID is an issue. I know, for example, that COVID rates are quite high in Kenya now or are rising where we've just sent an EU election observation mission. So every mission that we send does have um, a COVID health protocol for the mission uh, that they take there are standard measures now that they're taking in every country. Although I would also stress that one of the lessons learned is that the 
um, the situation of COVID in each country has been very different for our missions and the experience of the missions, I would say, has been very different. So uh, we've had to look really specifically at each country, where the pandemic is in that country, what the health facilities are, what the restrictions are, and what the trends of the pandemic are. But it, it, it really has been difficult to generalize because it's been, uh, it's been different everywhere. Um, I would say just as a personal reflection that I know different election observation, or I, I'm speaking now about international observer organizations, um, innovated in different ways, because we all had the same problem, like with the challenges in the world, how are we going to still send people out and observe elections? How are we going to restart this practice? And I think that some organizations innovated more than others. Um, probably the EU was one of the more cautious organizations uh, that may have something to do also with the, um, I don't know, the variety of, of countries where we observe and the fact that the EU observes outside of its member states, which is different than other regional organizations. Um, we'll be hearing Dries' experience soon from the AU, and it'll be interesting uh, what his reflection is about how, that's, how, that was, um, how that was considered by the African Union. Um, but I think that the EU did take a cautious approach. And while we had some aspects that could be remote, namely the briefings of observers before they went on mission. So both the core teams and in some cases the, the long-term and short-term observers were briefed at home remotely before they were deployed. Also so that short-term observers, you know, we wouldn't have a room of a hundred people being briefed all at the same time. So that's something um, that we started during COVID that, that might remain but we didn't um, have any aspects of our actual observation that were done remotely from outside of the country. I think other organizations did. And I, I think that's something for us as a community to reflect on, um, just also to urge a bit of caution, perhaps, uh, to what extent that you can really um, remotely observe an election. Although there are are things that um, these tools can help us to do, uh, whether we're in a pandemic or, or not, as we do work internationally. Um, and that's it from my side. Thanks very much, Toby. I look Brilliant. forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Holly. And as I could ask 101 questions uh, over all the things you've kind of, kind of said there, but I've kind of asked my questions in a way by, by, set, by setting those at the start. So thank you. And obviously there'll be a chance for, for people to ask questions at the end. Um, so we'll go to uh, next to Jonathan, Jonathan Stone Street, who's the Associate Director for the Democracy Programme at the Carter Centre. Uh, Jonathan joined the Carter Centre in September uh, 2014. Uh, he manages the Democracy Programme projects in Myanmar, but has also worked um, on election projects in Algeria, Bolivia, Burundi, uh, Nepal and many other countries. Um, and so without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Jonathan. Thank you for for joining us. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate the um, uh, uh, invitation to participate and, and speak on this panel. And, and preparing for it's been a really uh, great opportunity for me to reflect on the utility of this uh, <clears throat> discussion. Uh, uh, you know, personally, as, as a, a practitioner, it's very you know, uh, interesting to hear uh, the, the conclusions that, that Eric brought forward from from a wide array of, of groups, and then Holly's experiences, and and I, I, everything that you're saying is, you know, I feel is reflected in our own experience, um, uh, and and so that's that's interesting for me. Um, but it's also thinking about the future is, uh, you know, the, the world's moving ever more rapidly and is ever more complex. Um, and I think that the lessons that we learned are, are we learn are, are not only applicable for um, COVID, uh, but other transnational crises and that election observation uh, to some extent needs to think not only about the individual countries that it's observing, but stepping back, and looking at a, at a bigger picture on um, what the impact of these crises on election processes uh, more broadly than, than just in any individual election. Um, you, you know, we, we uh, I would divide the, the, our observations into sort of two phases in a way, in a way pre and post vaccine. 
Um, and I think that the, the, the way that we've approached things um, uh, and the way people think about um, uh, elections and, and COVID has changed in that, uh, based on those phases. So before there was a vaccine, uh, the Carter Center observed in Bolivia, um, uh, which is a remote mission, uh, Myanmar, uh, Cote d'Ivoire uh, together with ISA, and we observed the random manual audit of the results in Georgia in the 2020 elections. Uh, and our guy on the EOM was also impacted by, um, by, by COVID at the beginning. Post-vaccine, um, uh, our missions have actually been uh, smaller. Uh, we've had expert teams in Colombia, Palestine, Philippines, Venezuela, and Zambia, uh, but we have not done um, full missions uh, in, in any of those countries. Um, so what I've been thinking about, and, and, and you know, I'm taking, I'm hoping not to repeat points from, from Holly, so I, I might be skipping around a little bit. Um, uh, the, so the pandemic had an impact on how we observed and it had an impact on, on what we observed. Um, and, you know, Eric, as you said, the pandemic affected nearly uh, every part of election processes and it created issues for perceptions of integrity, inclusiveness and security in, in many countries holding elections over the past year. And some of these were like really fundamental um, issues and created maybe some fundamental uh, problems in, in society. Um, our ability to assess the impact was limited, um, not only by physical security measures, I, I would say, but um, also there's a gap, uh, I think, in international standards and commitments uh, regarding elections in times of, of national emergency. Um, so uh, just as an example, uh, uh, governments or election bodies are left with the decision of what do we do with the timing of an election? Is it um, uh, would we keep to the schedule, even though we might be going in the face of COVID um, in, 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 a, in a wave of COVID, or do we delay things? Either of those decisions uh, can create a challenge from the opposition of, of a, a manipulation of the election process. So already you're ramping up the heat, the intensity. Um, uh, it's no longer about policies. It's about the election process itself. And I've, I've always found that to be a dangerous moment when, when an election becomes about the election itself. Um, and I think, and, and just coming back to that, I, at the end, I'd like to come back to this big picture impact on uh, perceptions of election integrity uh, due to the other major transnational crises and not, not just a pandemic and not just COVID. Um, you know, Eric, so some of the things you mentioned, again, remote observation. Um, we, we, in Bolivia, we had a team that was largely remote until just before election day, uh, using virtual meetings uh, and supplementing that with, with cooperation with domestic observers on social media monitoring. Um, uh, not entirely satisfactory, but it was um, what, what could be done with the, the travel restrictions. Um, in Myanmar, um, we, we had remote, actually remote observation by our LTOs, uh, who, as Eric mentioned, were, and I'll come to that in a second about um, how they were recruited. Um, but they, uh, after they were recruited and trained, then travel restrictions were put in place. They couldn't travel. Uh, so um, they had to, to basically work remotely calling uh, election officials and other stakeholders. Um, it had the benefit of permitting many more interviews with interlocutors than would have otherwise been the case, uh, particularly in areas that we probably wouldn't have reached if uh, with in-person LTOs, conflict areas, remote areas. So we could do actually a lot more um, discussions um, and we could standardize information because we could prepare questionnaires and gather actually gather LTO data instead of relying only on, on narrative reports, uh, which I think gave a better overview of the process. And of course it had a negative impact. Uh, we, we weren't as visible. We weren't able to attend campaign events. We weren't able to attend look in voter education and, and uh, election official trainings and all the things that an LTO would do were had to be left by the wayside. So that created some gaps. Um, as Eric mentioned, we, we did have this hybrid mission. Uh, we, were, uh, we could not get uh, long-term observers or enough long-term observers into the country quickly enough to, to make it, uh, have, have an impact. Uh, so we came up with a solution which was permitted by Myanmar law and confirmed by the election commission uh, that we could accredit Myanmar citizens as, as observers. Um, and uh, so by doing this, uh, we were able to field many more uh, 
uh, LTOs than we'd originally planned. Uh, and we, we expanded their training time. Um, uh, and many of these people, folks had uh, experience with me in MAR elections. They, were, they had been domestic observers. And then we trained them in, in international methodology and how it was different. Um, and it worked really well. Um, I was very surprised. Uh, we, you know, we were concerned like about the possibility of bias, but that didn't really um, uh, happen. It didn't, didn't come through. And, and, and the, of course, the conversations they were able to have, uh, they didn't need interpreters. So there was much more direct. Um, and, and so I think there were a lot of benefits to that. Um, um, and, you know, I think it was an important in, in innovation. Um, we found there were reduction in, in mission profile. Um, uh, when, because of the ability for observers to be seen, but also the high level leadership, uh, many senior figures that we would normally use are in, were in a high risk category. So Cote d'Ivoire, Myanmar, we didn't have these high level figures at a press conference giving um, the, the, uh, the results of our observation, which you know, reduces the impact, it reduces the reach, I think. Uh, I, I don't wanna cover a lot of the, um, uh, operational burdens and, and uh, the uncertainty, but that was, you know, that detracted from the, the task at hand. You know, we had to, it was deployment questions and protocol testing, and do you have enough masks? And, and what about travel permissions? And how many people can be in the vehicle? All of these things, um, they, they, they really complicate things and make it actually more difficult for, especially for a smaller organization like the Carter Center to, to, to keep up with, um, you know, the practical side and the observation side. Um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, we looked at, at, at the same things that Holly mentioned, uh, the restrictions on, on movement and assembly that, that uh, created um, uh, differences in, in what we would more see more normally in election process, uh, restrictions being applied unequally uh, in some cases with the ruling party having greater leeway. We saw that in uh, several cases. Um, there was an increased importance to social media and the development of those methodologies, um, uh, which interestingly also gave us um, uh, as a sidelight uh, in a way, um, uh, an unintended consequence, I mean to say, that we were able to develop uh, tools for looking at uh, barriers to women's participation uh, in online campaigning um, in Myanmar. Um, Election management bodies were, were, were adjusting fairly rapidly, um, uh, making in some cases last minute decisions either to expand access. Uh, for instance, in Myanmar, uh, homebound voting became uh, for the elderly and other categories uh, was, was implemented rather quickly. Um, uh, whereas in, uh, in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, um, uh, it was it was a uh, voter registration was cut short uh, for security reasons and both of those had an impact on the process and both of those created uh, some some controversy um, and that you know neither of those things really would have happened without the pandemic. Um, the um, sorry I'm just looking through my notes here so I don't repeat too much. Um, um, the kind of the big picture impact, uh, I think, um, uh, going back to you know what I just mentioned about Myanmar and Cote d'Ivoire is that, um, and and what Holly said about the timing of elections, the important is that questions that were previously considered settled, um, election dates, voting procedures, uh, sometimes became highly contentious issues, and that increased the challenges to the perceptions of electoral integrity and widened divisions in, in some cases. And these questions included, you know, timing of elections, as I mentioned, um, rule changes to expand access uh, or to enhance security. Even in the US, uh, we saw that that was at the root of a lot of the 2020 election dispute, uh, expanded access. Um, uh, and then you come on to what are the public perceptions of political motivation? So even if there's not political motivations, many people will assume that there, there are political motivations um, and that affects public confidence. And then are the overall results being accepted or are they being challenged in part uh, due to the pandemic? And I think for the latter question, you know, without research, I would appreciate some research on this, but my feeling is that it's yes, it's um, more countries are probably experiencing uh, questions about the legitimacy of the results. Um, 
and maybe as international observer organizations, because we're focused on the process that we're observing and we don't compare elections, we've not necessarily been able to step back and, and see this bigger picture. Uh, so I think that's a lesson that we need to, to take on board. Um, other lessons, I think it's possible to supplement or modify the traditional uh, international election observation methodology. Some of the assumptions that we made that they have to be internationals, you can't have nationals as foreign observers. Um, maybe we need to rethink those. Um, remote observation had some benefits. And you know, I can see that, uh, for instance, looking forward in a country like uh, DRC, that having dedicated teams of remote observers able to call and to talk to officials and stakeholders in, in parts of the country that otherwise we wouldn't be able to reach will we'll have a, a, an enormous value. Um, uh, the checklist, the use of checklists by LTOs for us was, was I think a big innovation and uh, uh, help get a better picture of, of stakeholder perceptions of every aspect of the process. Um, and then, as Holly mentioned, we, we now know that we have the technology to conduct uh, remote pre-deployment trainings um, for LTOs and SDOs, so we can maybe reduce some costs, we can improve security, and we can have better observers um, instead of relying on one or two days of, of quick training as they're coming into a country tired and new to the whole thing. Um, we can give it some more time. Um, the gaps in international standards, another lesson learned. Uh, you know, obviously not something that we can take on directly, but um, it is difficult to assess the legitimacy of, of these sometimes extraordinary decisions taken that are maybe in response to the emergency, but maybe have political motivations. Um, and, and how do you assess that if there's no rules about it, there's no in agreed international framework for thinking about that. So that would be something, a lesson learned that I think hopefully could be addressed, not only for a pandemic, but for other crises. Um, because these, pro these complex crises are, are more and more as, as we globalize. So it's a pandemic, it's economic crisis, conflict, migration, climate change. Uh, all of these are going to impact election process um, uh, and perceptions of election legitimacy. Um, and so we should also think about the extent to which the pandemic and these other kinds of crises, crises are contributing to a transnational crisis in democracy. Um, so not only, you know, thinking about the individual country and making those assessments, but also using that information and, and um, realizing that elections and problems in elections are, are now globalized as much as anything else. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate, the, again, the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for all those insights. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, and, fit, and all these things fit very neatly with the themes that we've kind of been developing uh, throughout the week. You know, earlier on in the, in the week, we had a paper looking at the, you know, the effects of climate change on electoral integrity and how that can bring up um, uh, greater challenges and does seem to lead to reduce reductions in electoral integrity. So looking at those international standards again uh, does seem really, really important. Um, okay, brilliant. So without further ado, I um, would like to bring in uh, Adrisa Kamura. He's um, he currently serves as the political electoral affairs officer in the African Union Commission. He has um, over 17 years of professional experience managing and supporting electoral processes and democracy programs at the national and international levels, uh, including within the United Nations, the Carter Center and the International Republican Institute. Um, he's been involved in leading uh, missions across Africa, um, but also most recently um, participated in the UN election monitoring mission to Iraq's um, October 2021 House of Representatives election. Um, so without further ado, um, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Toby, um, for inviting us and uh, sharing the Africa Union experience. Um, um, being the, uh, the one to speak last, I think uh, a lot of what I'm supposed to say has been already covered, so I will avoid uh, repeating that and focus mostly on things that uh, are unique to the African Union um, context. Um, at the beginning of the COVID, um, we had about 20 member states uh, had planned elections on the continent, and uh, this is mostly national level elections uh, because they're uh, several local local level elections 
So at the beginning, um, before the pandemic was declared by WHO as pandemic, we actually ventured out, even though there were incidents of uh, COVID, we actually ventured out and observed elections in uh, a number of uh, countries, Cameroon, Comoros, and Togo. Uh, we observed those elections. But um, uh, by March, when WHO declared uh, there was a pandemic and there was a panic and airline were shut down, so we had to stop uh, observing elections. So in that case, the elections between March and October were yeah, completely out. So this includes Mali, for instance, uh, Burundi, etc. We were, I mean, not Mali, uh, Malawi, Burundi. We were not able to observe those elections because the airlines had shut down and uh, the situation was completely uh, difficult. And also our the Af the CDC advise against any official uh, travels uh, or activities of the African Union. So the organization itself shut down and we were not able. So we only resume observation towards the, the end uh, uh, part of 2021, starting from, from uh, September going uh, to December. So we, we, we managed to observe elections in, in Tanzania. The first elections we observed was Tanzania. Um, um, like what uh, Eric and uh, Holy said, um, uh, we, in terms of how we adapt, we even when we resume observing, uh, we just deploy just a small team. So in terms of the size where we did not deploy our large observation mission, uh, we deployed just a very limited uh, uh, mission. And um, because of the, 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 the COVID uh, uh, restrictions. So... Uh, Basically, we reduce the number of our observers and uh, we also try to recruit observers from the region uh, because uh, even when we resume observing uh, elections, uh, some member states have very strict uh, travel, travel restrictions and so we could not uh, uh, bring in people because we have a principle, uh, we ensure that our observation missions are uh, representative of the continent. So we draw from all the five regions of the continent. But in this case, because of some region, especially Southern Africa, for instance, the restrictions was very uh, severe. And so we, we decided to just uh, limit to those countries that have less uh, restriction uh, in terms of travel measures. And we also recruit from neighboring countries because of visa issues. Uh, we focus more on uh, recruiting uh, observers from. So basically these are a few uh, um, uh, adaptability measures that we, we undertook. But of course, also we introduced for the first time health and safety measures uh, in our observation missions, providing the observers briefings and trainings on, on uh, maintaining uh, COVID uh, uh, protocols, et cetera. Um, unlike other organizations, this was completely a new thing for us. We did not do that in, in previous time. So in terms of adaptability, basically this is what uh, uh, some of the measures that we, uh, we undertook to just uh, continue to observe. What worked for us uh, was uh, again, like I said, re-strategizing and adapting, reducing the number of our, our, the size of our observation mission, but also the type of missions uh, like Huli said, we also rely mostly on expert missions um, and reduce the size as well. So that works for us and it enables us to continue to observe. Unlike the EU and others that may uh, rely on a, an invitation, uh, for us, um, apart from financial challenges, uh, probably security challenges, uh, we hardly uh, decide based on political considerations because this is a very sensitive for our member states. So they always like for us to be there. And uh, it's difficult to say no when they extend an invitation, except where we don't have funds to deploy observers or there are security considerations, like in the case of uh, Somalia, we will not be able to observe. But uh, it's very difficult for us not to observe on the consideration of uh, the political context on the ground because. Um, uh, technical, I mean, our observation missions are also uh, a means of understanding the context and feeding into our conflict prevention uh, um, um, mechanism and infrastructure. So basically what, we, what works for us was the, the fact that we are able to adapt moving away from our large STO missions um, 
to small teams and expert nations. But also, of course, the, the health and safety measures that we, we put in place, but of course, uh, the national stakeholders put in place also help us to continue to work, um, to continue to observe elections. And when COVID uh, 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 broke out, we did not have any guide in terms of how to deal with this situation. But uh, because of um, uh, calls from our member states, we are able to develop uh, guidelines on that uh, to inform our, especially the election management body. Although the guideline is still being reviewed, it's still not being published, but uh, we, we develop guidelines that also guide uh, our work. So that was uh, something that worked for us. And uh, in our reporting and assessment, we also incorporated questions specifically relating to compliance uh, with uh, health and safety protocols. Um, this is also something that is uh, new in our reporting. What didn't work, um, I will join colleagues to say also that uh, the limitation that was placed in terms of movement was uh, actually impacted on the effectiveness of uh, our missions. For instance, uh, in some of the places we've been, because of the, 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 the decision to maintain a distance, especially around closing and counting process, you can imagine you, you are required to stay some two, three meters away, and that, is, that was not uh, very, very uh, helpful. And I think what I will add to uh, what Eric said uh, in terms of the challenges uh, was he did not mention the issue of costs. Um, you know, COVID raises the cost of election observation for us, both in terms of testing, you know, um, even now, whatever budget we prepare, we also prepare because there are still member states who are still asking for COVID tests and they're charging for that. So it's, it's added to our budget, but also the quarantine measures. Uh, they are, a few cases that we have where observers had to be quarantined and that increases the cost because we had to take care of their accommodation, but also pay their, their per diem as well. And of course, the protection measures that we put in terms of buying the protective, uh, the PPEs, et cetera. But as well as the ticket cost, you know, because a lot of airline shut down. And so uh, the cost of uh, traveling increases all of, a, all of a sudden. So all of that was, was a challenge. So. I think that's a, a, an addition I want to make to some of the challenges that um, uh, Eric mentioned. Um, from experience, I think uh, virtual rallies, I mean, restriction being put in place and uh, parties and candidates conducting virtual rallies, um, even though it was an adaptive, adaptive measure, but uh, from experience, uh, I believe that this is not a substitute to in-person mass uh, mass campaigns, especially for observation missions, because not all of the candidates and parties can actually uh, um, 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 conduct uh, serious and effective uh, rallies uh, uh, or online. Um, it's, there was also a challenge in terms of how our uh, reports are covered, but also during the preliminary statements. I remember in Zambia, uh, the, because of the fear of COVID, um, a lot of people did not turn up for our press conference. And equally for even for the EU, uh, they invited us, we attended, but they limited the number to just uh, a couple of uh, dozens of, of, of. So in terms of the visibility, as the previous speaker said, it's also impacted and because uh, people were afraid to, to come and witness the press conferences. And so it's limited that interaction with the public and as well as the media. Of course, the health risk exposure has already been mentioned. Um, uh, we, unlike others, we did not do a uh, virtual uh, observation or remote observation. Uh, although this was, uh, uh, I mean, a new, a new uh, adaptive measures, but uh, I, I think uh, the downside part of it is that it limits observation to only elite interaction because uh, most of the people you, you speak uh, um, virtually will be either civil society leaders or political candid uh, candidates and, 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 and party leaders. So it, it, it's difficult to speak to the grassroots uh, voters, et cetera. Um, we did that in Iraq, uh, just outside of the African Union. Uh, when I was with the UN in Iraq, mostly what we did for security reasons and also for the COVID, we did mostly uh, monitoring online. But uh, as I said, the downside of this is the fact that it limits observation to 
lack of elite interaction rather than uh, uh, rather than sampling the voices of ordinary citizens um and then also on unlike others we didn't up to date, we, we don't have any effective coordination mechanism with uh, citizen observers. So there was no way we can actually do uh, um, remote observation as NDIRI did in Egypt, I mean, in Ethiopia. So I think that that's, that's, that's an area that um, as a lesson learned that uh, going forward, there's a need for more uh, coordination efforts between uh, international observers and uh, as, as well as dom domestic uh, observers. Um, what are the lessons for the future? Uh, Eric mentioned on the timely invitation. I think uh, given the case of Burundi, where they actually strictly indicated that uh, for all observers, you have to guarantee for two weeks. And this was, uh, we received the invitation less than a month to the elections and putting in the two weeks uh, framework, I mean, the time frame means that we'll not be able to observe even election day. So I think uh, even if we are prepared to observe during uh, uh, the pandemic, there's a need for uh, a timely um, uh, uh, invitation to, to, to international observer groups. As I have already said, citizen observers uh, remain the key, as we've seen, whenever travels are, if travels are um, shut down, uh, there's no way you can travel. And I think we can only rely on citizen observers. So I think uh, uh, this is, this improves, it would be quite important. Um, I've, I, from our experience, uh, we've been working closely with the Africa CDC that provide gui uh, advisory to us and guidance. And I think this is also very important going forward um, for us to, uh, for international observation missions to work closely with uh, health professionals in situations of uh, COVID-19 and similar situations as well. Another lesson learned is that um, the decision to postpone elections um, should be based on careful assessment. We've seen the, the fallout in Ethiopia. Uh, if decisions are based uh, on just um, parties and political considerations, they will be serious consequences because the decision to postpone or continue has uh, uh, a legal, uh, financial and political risk. And all of this has to be uh, taken into consideration before elections are conducted um, uh, or postponed. Because even if elections are conducted, there are still legal risks. For instance, there is a state of emergency. So navigating between compliance with the state of emergency and exercising democratic rights, I think there's, there's a lot of risk around that. So there's a need for a careful consideration of all of this uh, before decisions are made, whether to continue or not, or to postpone the elections. Um, for us, one of the disadvantage uh, colleagues have mentioned the fact that they have done remote briefing of observers. That's good. Uh, it's something that I've noted. But one of the disadvantage on the continents is the fact that the ICT infrastructure is virtually uh, very weak. And so in order to carry out either remote uh, briefing of observers, remote uh, 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 observation, you need a good ICT infrastructure because otherwise there's no way uh, I can organize when some of our observers don't even have electricity or don't even have a strong uh, internet network. So uh, I think this is uh, something that uh, and, and needs to, uh, that's also a challenge on the, on the continent. Um, yeah, so I think I can just uh, stop here because most of the things that I've, I've, I've wanted to say has already been covered and I, I think uh, there's not enough time for Q&A. So, I'll stop there so far. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so many important insights. So we're very grateful for all those. Uh, I mean, just on the cost one, for example, I think um, as part of the book um, that Eric mentioned, we looked at the cost of elections for electoral management bodies, and we see that big rise there. But I think it's a really important point that uh, in, in a election observation organisations are also experiencing those costs. Mm -hmm.